Good evening. Welcome out to Mount Isle this evening. Let's sing number 66. <clears throat> Number 66. <clears throat>
Well, good evening to each of you, and welcome back to the service here this evening. This evening, we're happy to have uh, Brother Jeff Messenger and his wife Cheryl and daughter Hannah with us, and he's going to plans to bring us the message. I believe the title, "Have a Ready Answer." So we're looking forward to that. But first, he'd like to do a children's meeting. So we're going to invite all the children up to these first two benches, and Brother Jeff is going to have that meeting, so you can go ahead and come on up. And whenever he's finished with that, uh, lead into his other, lead into the message, and he can close with that however he he wishes, and uh, I'll come back up after that. Well, good evening. How are you all tonight? Good. Do you like to come to church in the evening? Get to stay up late? No, not really. What do I have? What do I have here? A mug. Do you notice anything special about my mug? It has lighthouses on it. It's broken. Wow, that's, I didn't know that. That must have been when I threw it in the back of the truck, huh? You think maybe I broke the handle then? Well, that's, that's pretty bad. This, this is my wife's favorite mug. What do you think I should do? She's not going to be real happy. You think maybe, um, maybe I should throw it away and then... She wouldn't, she wouldn't find it. She'd, maybe she'd never know, huh? What do you think? No? You don't think that's going to work? Wow. I know. I could tell her the children broke it. Right? They break stuff all the time. That, that's pretty, pretty reasonable, don't you think? No? What am I going to do? Tell her I broke it. Don't you think she'll be mad? Won't she be mad? You don't think she'll be mad? I don't know. You all don't know my wife very well. Well, I'll tell you what. The truth is, you're right. That's what I have to do. I have to to tell her I broke it. And she might be mad. But you know what? It'll be okay. Okay. I know that she'll forgive me. You know why I know she'll forgive me? For breaking her favorite mug because I threw it in the back of the truck? Because she loves me more than she loves her mug. You believe that? Good, because so do I. (laughs) But you know what? You make mistakes too, right? Right? And sometimes maybe, well, maybe you'll make a mistake or, or maybe sometimes you'll just do something wrong just because you want to. And you have to own up to that, right? And whatever happens in your life, whatever you do, whatever goes wrong, you can always tell God. Do you know why? Because God loves you more than he hates whatever you did. And the Bible tells us that when we confess what we've done, to confess our sins to God, that he is faithful and just to forgive us. So he's faithful. He, he will forgive us. And he's just. So that means that it's a good thing to forgive because God always does the good thing. So he's not letting you get away with something, but he's forgiving you for what you did. I'm going to have to buy my wife a new mug. But she's going to forgive me. Right? Do you all understand? Does that make sense? Okay, we all can go back to your parents, and they can help make a little more sense, I'm sure. Go on back. Thank you. Well, good evening. It's my... Great pleasure and privilege to greet you in the name of Jesus this evening. And we're uh, 
very happy to be here to visit with you all. I'm turning me to Psalm 121. Okay, now I don't have a reputation for being brief, so I won't make you all turn to all the um, scriptures that we refer to, just the long ones, to help you out a little bit with the time there. So Psalm 121, we'll start at verse 1. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made the heaven and the earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Where does my help come from? Our title this morning is Have a Ready Answer. Who is my helper? Or accountability. You know, roads, roads take the easiest course. They go through along the bottom lands. They go between and around the hills, not over them usually. And between the mountains. Down where I live in the middle of the valley, that's pretty obvious to us. right? Every cut in the mountains on either side has a major road going through it. You don't necessarily just go up over the road. It's not an easy way to go. But the problem with that is that the roads can, the mountains on either side of our road can hide dangers. As the psalmist is passing along the road, he's looking up at the hills on either side around him, and he knows that they can hide enemies, bandits, who can attack suddenly with the advantage of height. He asks, where does my help come from? Now, this psalm is a song of ascents. That means that the pilgrims sang these hymns as they were going up to Jerusalem. So on the way to Jerusalem, they would be singing hymns, among them this one. And like them, our walk takes us between the mountains. We're surrounded by an ungodly society, by scoffers and haters of the Lord, people doing and approving of all kinds of evil. We're ambushed and attacked from every side. How are we going to make it home? The answer for the pilgrims and for us is the same. And it comes immediately for us in verse 2, immediately after the question. My helper is the Lord. So what does that help look like? How do we access it? How do we get it? How do we call for it? How does God send it? Well, one way that he provides that help for us is through accountability. Now, in our churches, we talk about accountability a lot. But people in unregulated churches, churches that don't have any kind of church discipline, they really don't have any reference point when you talk about accountability. What what does that mean? People outside the church, it's even less so. If you take out the king's money and you look at it, it has two mottos on it, right? It has e pluribus unum, from many one. That's a good motto for the the church, wouldn't it be? From many one. And it says, in God we trust. But I would put to you that really today, in today's society, you could take both of those off and you could just say, nunya. Today's motto is, nunya business. So when you talk about accountability, people would say, well, what business is it of you? What's going on with me? Or what I'm doing? So it's one of those things that you might just be asked questions about. For people who want to know about your faith, your church, what's it like? What is this accountability business? 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that, whereas they speak evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ." So do we have the answers? What is accountability? How does it help me? Do do we know? Well, again, what what are the questions then? 
What does it even mean to be accountable? Accountable for what? Accountable to whom? Perhaps most importantly, how is accountability a help to me as I try to navigate my way through this life? Well, what does accountability mean? How is it used in Scripture? Well, actually, the form accountability isn't. In the King James Bible, we don't really have the word accountability. But the word account appears in the New Testament in the King James 11 times. Now, eight of those 11 times, the same word is translated as account. Matthew 12, 36, they shall give account thereof. Matthew 18, 23, would take account of his servants. Luke 16, 2, give an account of thy stewardship. Acts 19, 40, give an account of this. Romans 14, 12, give an account of himself to God. Philippians 4, 17, fruit may abound to your account. Hebrews 13, 17, as they must give account. And 1 Peter 4, 5, who shall give account to him? And we'll look at most of these verses as we go along. But in each one of these, we see an explanation and a promise of judgment. Except for Philippians 4.17, they all sound a little negative, don't they? We're going to have to account for this. You're going to have to account for that. We get the picture of a ledger of the accounts being in balance or out of balance. Is there enough good? Are there enough payments on this side to offset the bad or the debt on the other side? Basic accounting 101. How does that help me? But these eight places, they aren't the only time that this Greek word is used in the New Testament. In fact, the word is used quite a lot. And maybe if we saw some of the other places... But I wonder if then we might think of this accounting in a, in a different light, that this is more than just God taking measure of the things we do. Maybe we could get a better idea if we looked at some of those other verses where that word is used. How about this one? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The word translated as account in those other eight verses, is used, is translated here as word. That word is logos. Now, you've probably heard logos preached about, especially in the context of this verse before. To any Greek person, every adult Greek would know that he would be expected to explain what his logos was. His logos was his, his reason for life. For all the things that he did. Everything, I go out and do this because this fits my logos. This is part of what I believe. This is what drives me. This is what informs all of the decisions I make are my logos. It's the thoughts and the knowledge that you live and make decisions by. A, a man's logos was really the word that he lived by. Christ is described as the word because he shows us God's logos. Everything that Jesus did teaches us what God thinks and why he thinks it. Jesus showed us God's innermost thoughts, his mind. In addition to that, a man's logos was his story. It's more than just an accountant's ledger of good and bad acts. His logos was the account, the story of his entire life. All the things he had thought and done and the reasons that he had acted the way he did. Even if you're a parent, if you're a parent even if you're not a parent, you've, you've probably experienced some young child who's run up to you to tell you the complex story of something that happened to him in his day. Oh, that there was this and there was this and there was this and there was this and there's just no way that you can keep up. And you wonder, how can I get all these little details straight? He's anxious to tell you his story. If you are a parent, you've probably also heard that same child tell you his confession of something he wasn't supposed to do that day. Well, each of us has that same opportunity. 
we'll have the opportunity to give our account, our story, our logos, the things that we did and the reasons that we did them to God. Is it going to be a story that we're like that little child anxious to tell? So that's what accountability is. It's the opportunity or the requirement to share our story. So who will we tell our story to? Well, Romans 14, 11, and 12 says, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Now Paul's quoting Isaiah here, Isaiah 45, 23. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall swear. God created us. He designed a purpose for us. And he has every right to ask for an account from us. And he clearly states that he's going to do just that. And scripture speaks repeatedly of this accounting. Most famously in Revelation 20:12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So we will give our account. We will tell God our logos. So accountable for what? What are we to be accountable for? What in our story is it that God wants to hear? What are the things we've done to tell? What are the things we have to tell him? Revelation 20, 12 tells us we'll be judged according to our works, according to the things that we have done. Jesus also tells us that we'll be judged according to the things we have not done. In Matthew 25, 45, he says, Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. We will explain the evil thoughts that we have harbored and the resulting words that we have spoken. In Matthew 12, 35, Jesus says, A good man out of the treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. But we will also be able to tell of things that we have done for the Lord, the good things that we have done. And Philippians 4, 15 and 17 says, Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. The good things on the good side of the ledger. But this is still all about judgment. How is judgment a help? To, judgment seems like a bad thing, doesn't it? It seems like something I really don't want to go through. So how is that a help to me? Well, we all know our own story. And we also know that everyone's story includes sin. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned, and come short of the glory of God. Hebrews 4.13 says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. We can't hide our sins from God. I can't throw the cup away, and God won't know. So we have that knowledge, the knowledge of our sin and we have to know the knowledge that we have to tell our story to the Lord. And that compels us to find a remedy for the situation that we find ourselves in. We have to have an answer for the things that we have done to the Lord. Well, in Acts 2, 37 and 38, the people said, in response to Peter's sermon, they were pricked in the heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The knowledge that our story is not in line with what God wants to hear drives us into 
the arms of Christ. That is a help to us. Having accepted Christ then, we also continue to test our readiness, to look at our story. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. You know your story. Judgment is not a pop quiz. Do you remember in school when you had that that day when there was really nothing going on and you're all ready and you can just go into class and I'm just going to be able to skate today. And the teacher or the professor came in and he had that little grin on his face and he said, we're going to have a pop quiz. And you knew you were dead. Right? I studied nothing because I didn't know this was coming. God's not like that. We know every day of our lives what God has expected of us. We know our story. You can look back over your life and know the things that you have done. You know where you are. We know if the main character of our story is ourselves or if it's Jesus Christ. And this knowledge is a mercy and a help to us. Acts 4, 11 and 12 says, This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there any salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. We can be saved. We can change our story. When the main character of our story becomes Jesus, judgment turns to grace. God has made a way for us to travel the valley between the hills and to bring us out safe again. And we have his many promises that he will bring us through. So how does he do it then? Where does this help come from? How do I get this help through this accountability? What are the sources? Am I my own helper? We live in a time of of self-help. If you go into any bookstore, the largest section by far is the self-help section. Does that work? I have a lot of diet books, and this coat still isn't buttoning. So I don't know if that always works so good. But the Bible is full of self-help tips. The Bible tells us the things that we need to do. First, we can be accountable to ourselves. We saw in 2 Corinthians 13, we can review our story. We can examine ourselves to see if Christ is on our throne. And if he is then Scripture tells us how to keep him there. If he's not, Scripture tells us how to get him there. Colossians 3, 1 and 2 says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on the things above, not on the things of the earth. We can help ourselves by our focus, by seeking Jesus and not the temporary things of this world. Philippians 4.8 says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. The temptation comes to us through the mind. And the mind makes the body act. If we keep our minds focused on good things, on lovely things, on godly things, then temptation is pushed away. We help ourselves again by the things that we focus on in the world. Romans 12, 2 says, And be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the right and good and acceptable perfect will of God. This exercise strengthens our minds and our hearts and allows us to see God's plan for us. So God gives us advice to help ourselves. Is that all he does? Or or is he done there? I gave you the book. You're on your way. You're on your own. No. God himself becomes our helper. We are accountable to God, but he does everything that he can to make sure our story 
is pleasing to him because he wants us to be with him. God doesn't just leave us to help ourselves. He has provided the way to salvation, sought us out, and rescued us. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation I have succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And Paul's quoting Isaiah there again. God's generous offer is for everyone's sin to be covered. 1 John 22 says, And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. His offer extends to adopting us into his family. Colossians 1, 12 through 14 says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption of, through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. He reaches out and pursues us even as we defy him. Isaiah 118 says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Jesus promises that he and the Father will actually live in us. John 14, 19 says, Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world? And Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love thee, me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him, to live with you and in you. God himself offers to be your helper. But he doesn't stop there. He surrounds us with even more helpers. The church is our helper. God has given us the church as a safe place to worship him and to tell our stories. Different groups of people in the church are there to help you in different ways. You have your ministry. Well, now, why should you share your account with the church or with the ministry in particular? Why, why do I want to talk to my ministry about my struggles or my story? And turn to 1 Peter 5. Make sure you're awake. I started there at verse 1. And Peter writes, The elders which are among you I exhort... Who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, Ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Why are we all here? Why have we chosen to be here tonight? Why are you here in this building with these people on any day? Because we find ourselves on the same road. And we all want to have the same destination. We're here willingly because we want to be with Jesus. Your church leaders aren't shepherds because it's profitable in any worldly sense. But because they love the Lord, they love you, and they want to serve you. They want to serve God. Flip back to Hebrews 13.
and down to verse 16. But to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. They that must give account. Your story is part of your ministry's story. What did we do when this sheep was astray? What did we do when this one was threatened? What did we do when the flock was endangered? Did we love the sheep? Were the sheep properly taught? Did we offer our lives for them? When there are bumps in your story, you should be able to share them with your church because your church loves you. You should be able to go to your ministry because your ministry loves you. How much? Do they love you enough to listen to your story? Philemon 18 and 19 says... If he hath wronged thee, or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it. Albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me, even thine own self besides. So Paul wrote to Philemon, asking him to welcome back a runaway slave, to take him back, to greet him as a fellow Christian even as he would accept Paul himself. Now, the, now, this slave, he had stolen from the man. Apparently, he stole from him twice. Okay, on his way out, he stole something, maybe to help him get to Rome or wherever he was going. And by leaving, he stole himself. Right? He was Philemon's property. So he stole from him twice. And here Paul says, whatever wrong or debt he has to you, Put it on my account. And the word used here, it actually does refer to a financial ledger. Put it on my account, and I will pay it. What do you owe to God? Do we love you that much? Does your ministry love you that much that they would say that to God on your behalf? Didn't God already say it? Back there in Hebrews 13, 17, they must give an account for you. You are on their account. You are part of their story. Willingly, as Peter said, because they love you that much. Your brothers and sisters are your helpers. All believers are charged to warn those who stray. You can probably all quote Ezekiel 3, 18 and 19. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked... And he turned not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way. He shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. If we live like this, it should not be possible to be a part of the church and not be warned when our story is not what it should be. When we are not living the life that we should, it should not be possible to be in the church unwarned. This is a tremendous help to anyone who is simply willing to listen. We can all be tempted. We can all be deceived. We can all be willful. A warning from a loving brother or sister can simply save our souls. When someone falls, all believers should have a heart to seek them out and bring them home. It isn't just 
the ministry's job. Your brothers and sisters are part of your story. James 5, 19 and 20 says, My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Just as the psalmist's caravan was able to better fend off robbers than a lone traveler, there is safety in the numbers of the church. Close relationships with our brothers and sisters in the church make us stronger in our Christian walk. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12 says, Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. We build each other up when we share our stories, when we give our accounts one to another. We're stronger together than we are alone. The real strength here is that these are relationships. This isn't one person lording over the other person. This is brothers and sisters living as one, reaching out to help each other. Ephesians 5.21 says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. So we have all this help. So how do we get it? Well, that's part of that is why we're here, isn't it? 1 Corinthians 1.10 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Unity. We preach a lot about unity. Why is that so important? It's hard to help each other in our Christian walk if we don't agree on what that walk looks like. If I can tell you this is a problem in your life and you would just say, no, it's not, if we don't have that agreement, it's kind of hard to be able to help each other along. Agreement is really important. Ephesians 4.25 says, what, Wherefore, put away lying. Speak every man the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. So members of the body means members together. I'm not just a member and you're a member of me. I'm a member of you. We're, we're together. And the more honest and open we are with each other, the more we can help each other. If I'm willing to share with you the struggles that I have, then you can help me. And if you're willing to share with me, then I can help you. It takes honesty and trust. James 5.13 says, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing songs. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let him pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of the faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So we have all this help. We have the scripture. We have the Lord. We have our ministry. We have our brothers and sisters. But you might have noticed along about this point that not only do you have help available to you, but you're a helper as well. You're a worker in this as well. You're part of the team. So what do we do when someone tells us their story? How do we respond? What if their story isn't so great? What if it's really terrible? What, what if the main character of their story is, is self? There's no Jesus there. You thought there was. What if the main character of their story is even Satan? How, how lost could they be? What if their story is a story of terrible struggle? What is our responsibility? What are, what are we supposed to do when, when we hear this story? Turn over to Romans 14.
and down to verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess God. And so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. First, when we hear our brother's story, we have to remember that we don't get to judge. Now, you discern how things are. You know whether they're doing right or wrong, but you don't get to apply judgment to them. Judgment is reserved for God. Our response to a brother or a sister's story is going to determine whether our brother or sister will be able to confess their sin here. If the only result of coming up here and confessing to the church for a struggle or a fall is that they are shamed and gossiped about, you can pretty safely predict that there aren't going to be very many confessions. People don't confess because they're overcome by guilt. They, they don't confess because they're convinced that their sin is terrible and they need to confess. People confess because they want your help. They confess when they've reached the end of their rope and they realize they can't do it by themselves anymore. Confession is a cry for help. And it's an incredible trust placed in you when someone confesses to you what's going on in their life. Galatians 6 verse 1 says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then he shall have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. It's kind of a confusing passage there. Well, we bear one another's burdens, but every man will bear his own burden. And either spiritual will restore one, considering yourself, lest you be tempted. What does that mean? Are you perhaps tempted by what the other person has gone through? We're all subject to temptations. We will often think, I would never fall to what my brother fell to. But that's not being tempted by them. That's being tempted by pride. Right? Paul is warning us against pride here. Would we think ourselves better than our brother because he fell and we did not? Do we not remember the times in our lives when we struggled and then apply the mercy to him that we needed so desperately at that time? Every man bearing his own burden, you bear the burden of your own sin. You, should, you need to be able to carry it and take on your brother's burden without applying it to him. So when someone is struggling with something that you have victory in, you should be better able to help him, not repelled by him. You have to carry your own burden and take on your brother or sister's as well. We are to comfort and to restore and to bear each other's burdens. We have to freely love, freely forgive, and freely encourage when we try to help our brothers and sisters. And it's hard to forgive. People do terrible things. But we have to remember that vengeance is God's. Our duty is to seek to restore the fallen so that they can serve God again. If God would accept his service again, who are we to deny them? Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, Let us consider one another 
to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Nowhere in Scripture are we instructed to tear each other down. Your brother's story is probably that he's already been torn down. Your job is to seek to build him back up. When a brother or sister gives us their account, when they tell us their story and, and we listen, whether they come up here and tell the whole church or whether they're so desperate and broken that they can only barely whisper it to you, their story becomes part of your story. What did you do? You've been chosen to help that person. He doesn't expect you, God does not expect you to run and tell the ministry or a bunch of other people what this person has laid on you. You're expected to help. Talk. Listen. Pray. Visit. Question. Answer. Comfort. If your help isn't bringing that person closer to victory, if you aren't enough, then you have to convince them to bring in more help. You have to keep their trust. They've trusted you to help them, but they do need more help. You have to keep their trust. You convince them to bring in more help, to share their story with another person, another brother or sister, to expand their trust. And then you keep adding help until the victory is won. And then they can joyfully confess to everyone, thank you for carrying me to the victory. Whether they spoke only to you or whether they spoke to the whole church, if you were just sitting here and there was a confession and you had no idea, you call and check on them. Well, brother, how's it going with you? Sister, how are you doing? How's your walk? I was a Christian for 40 years before a brother ever asked me, how's your walk? It was a Mennonite. <laughs> and he would just call me up out of the blue. Brother Jeff, how's your walk? How much more should we be doing that for brothers and sisters that we know are having a struggle? Call and check on them. And if they call you and they say, brother, I'm struggling, go. Don't, don't say, I'm with you in spirit. Don't say, oh, I'll pray with you on the phone. Go. Go, meet them somewhere, be with them, pray together, strengthen them, show them your love with your presence. And I mean go. I'm talking leave the chopper running in the field and go. I'm talking get up from the dinner table and go. Your brother's soul is on the line. Would you not go? Go and be with them and strengthen them. There is nothing better that you can do than to go and hold his hand. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. You don't know what to do when you go? This is what you do. If that is the way we respond to each other when we struggle, we will see instead of failure after failure in the church, we will see victory after victory because God has made us a way for our help to come through accountability.
Let's sing number 973. <clears throat> 973, and the um, refrain is sung after the last stanza. <clears throat> Thank you for that message, Brother Jeff. That was very good, solid scriptural teaching, very practical, thinking about the burden that lies not only between our own heart and conscience before God, but our responsibility to our brothers really rounded out a, a good day of teaching about communication in the brotherhood. So thank you for that. I'm sorry I didn't uh, do a very good job of introducing Brother Jeff. He comes from the Bethesda congregation in sure, town Dayton, Virginia? Broadway. Broadway, Virginia. All right. Well, thank you for coming, and thank you each for coming. So let's stand for dismissal. Brother Randy, would you have a prayer and dismissal?